Ik ben Faustina en ik woon uh, nu in Nederland één jaar. So mijn Nederlands is niet uh, goed. Ik ga proberen, maar als het moeilijk gaat, ga ik uh, in Engels uh, spreken. Um, mijn vader en moeder wa waren allebei onderwijzer. Ik ging naar de middelbare school en kreeg een goede diploma, opleiding, sorry. Die was gericht op onderwijs en volwassenen en basisgezondheid zorg. Um, de enige plek, ik denk, waar ik uh, als een kind waar ik moest uh, op tijd ben, was op school en in de kerk. Ik kreeg mijn eerste horloge toen ik uh, 14 jaar was. En soms het werkt het niet, maar als iemand uh, vraagt hoe laat het is, ik, uh, mensen zeggen ja. Ik weet het niet, het werkte niet, maar het is uh, alleen als uh, status. Eh? Dat was eerder, maar nu wel. Het, uh, het heeft uh, veranderd. Um, in Kenia was er weinig werk. Uh, daarom ben ik in 2000 naar Sudan, Zuid-Sudan, gegaan. Dat is ons buurland. Um, ik heb eerst voor eerste uh, partners gewerkt. Later ben ik voor de Carter Center gaan werken tot 2009. Um, ja. Dat is Zuid-Sudan. En Zuid-Sudan staat op een keerpunt. Het land wordt deze maand onafhankelijk na een oorlog van 23 jaar. De jongste natie in de wereld. The best and the most recent example of the uh, fighting for the four freedoms that uh, Franklin uh, Roosevelt uh, stated. Um, in South Sudan worked I in a gebied van uh, 80.000 vierkante kilometer. And meestal we moeten vliegen of met kleine vliegtuigjes. And uh, met four wheel drive and soms met de motor and uh, kamperen and all that. Um, ik heb, uh, in South Sudan ik heb ik uh, werk, gewerkt met uh, uh, verschillende stammen. Maar meestal met de, uh, ik werk, werkte ik vooral bij de Toposa, uh, een, een herdersvolk. Hun koeien zijn de koningen. Ze hebben geen besef van tijd. Ze gaat met de koeien het dorp uit als de zon opkomt. En ze, ga, ze kwamen terug als, als lange schaduwen zijn. Ze vroegen, ze vroegen de, de, de kinderen van de Toposa uh, mensen, ze vroegen mij, wanneer ben je geboren? Ik zeg, uh, overdag. En ze noemden, ze noemden mij Nakolong. Die is geboren als de zon schijnt. So, altijd, mijn naam was Nakolong, als ik ga naar de dorp... Uh, yeah. Kinderen altijd, nakolong, nakolong, hey. En de toposa, they wear clothes made out of skin and they decorate them with, with, with uh, crouches, beads, different colors, like on, on that you can see green and red and yellow. Very beautiful. And they wander in moeilijk plaatsen. Uh, Vaak moest ik uren lopen in de heuvels bij een dorp te komen. Je moest heel vroeg in het dorp zijn als je mensen wat wilde vertellen. Voordat ze met de koeien het veld ingingen, dus s morgens voor zeven uur. Ja, dit is een uh, gebied. En, uh, een toposa man kan uh, kan hebben uh, several women. Five, ten, depending on how much cows he has, and he can have as many children also. And it is his uh, responsibility to make sure that uh, his wives and children have enough to eat. And they live in a compound, just like uh, the one you see. What did I do in Southern Sudan exactly? I was uh, dealing with public health diseases, and. Uh, First, I was dealing with community development, like uh, dealing with women groups and, and, and teaching people about uh, the importance of girl-child education and doing basis uh, gezondheid zorg. And later on, when I worked with the Carter Center, I was, uh, we were dealing with basically two diseases which were a, a public health problem, trachoma and guinea. 
and had to, it was it was really difficult then because I went I went to work in Sudan during the war. One time we were after passing the Kenyan border from Kenya, we were coming in with the cars, and the first village we stopped in was uh, was called Narus, and that is where we usually uh, waited, rested a bit before we moved on because the journey was long. We were taking about 10 hours drive in the in the cars, and usually we were like three or four cars going like a convoy. And I remember in Narus, uh, my first experience with war, it was terrible. And um, then we were just, I, was, I think I was standing talking to somebody near a school, and suddenly I saw people starting to run and screaming, and they were fearful, and even children and dogs and chickens, and everybody was running, really scared. And, and then they started screaming, Antonov, Antonov. For then, by then, I didn't know what an Antonov was. I knew Sudan was at war, but I didn't know exactly how it feels to be, to be in it. So, and then suddenly, it was a clear, clear blue sky, and suddenly I saw a plane coming, vroom, 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 and I was like, yeah, that's a plane. And then suddenly I felt somebody push me down, and then the bombs started falling. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Then that's when I realized, oh my gosh, they are bombing us. And then I just, somebody pushed me down and I fell down and somebody else came to lie on top of me and we were there for, I don't know how long, maybe it was two minutes, maybe it was three minutes, maybe five, I couldn't remember. Up to now I cannot yet remember. But after the bombing, in total people who counted said there were 11 bombs. After the bombing there were some dead people. I didn't go to see the dead people, but uh, there were casualties, people uh, with arms missing, legs missing, and it was really terrible. That's when I really had my first experience with war. And lying there, I was just praying to God, and I was saying, like, please, I don't want to die in South Sudan. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, after that, that was the daily living of people, for most people that then, during the war. Um, they, they experienced that every time, and for me it was my first time, and lucky enough I didn't experience the bombing again. I was very lucky. And I went to work in a completely uh, other village also. Um, uh, this is a, a picture of uh, people working in the Nile, uh, living along the Nile, and most of them are fisher, fishermen. And uh, they can catch fish as big as this. And uh, that's, they, they are called the Nuer people, another tribe. And that's uh, trachoma, a disease that uh, uh, is spread by, by flies, basically, uh, from one person to another. And uh, it, it's uh, associated with uh, socioeconomic uh, issues and people who have who are poor and they lack basic hygiene and they don't have enough water to wash their faces. And it leads to, to blindness also. So part of my job was to educate people about the disease to make sure they are washing their faces and distribute antibiotics uh, for people who are already affected and identify also those who, had, who are extremely affected so that we can bring in uh, surgeons who are uh, uh, operating on the eyes. Um, And then the other, the other disease I, I worked with was uh, uh, guinea worm. Guinea worm um, comes from drinking uh, contaminated water. And people drink, uh, on, on, the, on the left, you can see a picture of, of really like a stagnant pool. That's, that's what most people in South Sudan, even up to now, they're drinking from. And, and there are very few boreholes on the picture. On the right, there are very few boreholes. And when they are there, the whole night, the whole day, it's like that, full of jerrycans. It's all, the whole 24 hours it's uh, used. So most of the time the boreholes were broken and then they go back to, drink, uh, to drinking the, the water from the pools, the life sucker of the guinea worm. Um, the, the, a person suffering from guinea worm first goes into the water and contaminates the water source with a worm, which is maybe coming out from his foot. The eggs go into the water. And when other people come in to drink the water, the, the eggs go into the body. And after one year, they come out as a live, live worm. So that was part of my, uh, my, 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 my job to also educate people, especially uh, to make sure they are drinking safe and clean water. And if they don't have safe and clean water, we were distributing uh, intervention materials like 
uh, filter clothes and filter pipes, then they can filter their water, and also to treat to treat uh, that's a guinea worm coming out from a foot. Most of the time they, they came out from the feet, the lower part of the body, and sometimes also on the arms. And the one, uh, one time we had a case of a, a worm coming out from the head of a child, so it was, uh, it's, it was not um, a, a, a killer disease, but it could make somebody uh, paralyzed, then you, people are not able to take care, of, like women were not able to take care of the children or to farm, or the men were not able to take care of their cows, so it affected them economically. Um, uh, there, I'm giving health education to people and training. Uh, we were as asking people to be volunteers for our work and help us in giving health education messages to the villagers because there were so many villagers and uh, we were not able to reach all of them, so we used village volunteers to do that, and our work was to train them in the, in the disease, and then they help us in passing on the message. Yeah, that's another group of people called the GIE. They are almost like the, the Toposa people. Um, and we were... Yeah, what we did was also to treat the water sources, the first pond you saw. We were treating it with chemicals to kill the, the lava in the water. Public, public transport was not much. A lot of people were, were walking long distances, maybe even uh, 100 kilometers. They could take days, and this is a picture of a woman carrying a baby. The baby is in the basket, and uh, that's how they, they used to travel and for long distance. And sometimes we could go into a vill village expecting to meet somebody who was sick, but then they were not there. Maybe they had walked to another place. So those are just some of the challenges. We first. The nature also was uh, in southern Sudan. Nature is often more powerful. There could be heavy rains. The rains turned the roads into mud, and then we could not travel, or the vehicle got stuck. Uh, like the, you cannot see it clearly, but uh, down bottom where you see the car on the left side, uh, it's a river, and and in, in South Sudan you could get a lot of that. Um, rivers and when it rains in the mountains the water comes and if you are stuck in the middle it takes away your car so those are some of the problems we were having um, also that's a bridge built by uh, Dutch people and some of the bridges are broken because a lot of uh, uh, trucks which were coming in with uh, goods from from uh, Kenya or Uganda taking into Sudan uh, they, maybe they were too heavy for, for, the, uh, for the bridges and they, most of them were breaking down also. And now the, the Dutch uh, people are back in Sudan building the Bailey bridges like this to repair and to repair some of them. Here I'm trying to be a pilot. <laughs> That's uh, one of the amazing things I could do in Sudan. I don't think they can allow me to do that here. <laughs> yeah. I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, um, sometimes planes got problems and were not able to fly again. For instance, this one was coming to land and then it just crashed into uh, somebody's shop. And fortunately, nobody was injured. And a lot of the times they are just left there. Yeah, to, and then, yeah. So if you go like into South Sudan, there are a lot of uh, planes lying around from either mechanical problems or being bombed down during the war and things like that. And there also another plane which had mechanical problems and it just landed there and was left in at the airstrip and we were <laughs> practicing with our new bikes we got for our job and we were trying to make a round uh, on the airstrip. And around the plane, you see where they, are, uh, they have put uh, uh, trees which have thorns to cover places where landmines are. So nobody can go around like uh, near the plane. Uh, there are still landmines. Um, and that's a common, uh, a common thing you see in, in South Sudan. Also, yeah, a lot of armor with people due to the civil war, uh, tanks, 
landmines, huge uh, machine guns or rocket launchers. These are uh, youth. We were training them, but they all have, they are all armed because um, they sometimes they fight with uh, the local uh, other tribes which have cows and they tr steal from each other cows, which, which is, uh, it's part of their tradition, but we were also trying to engage them into um, changing the habits and incorporating with our own health uh, education. Yeah, that's, uh, you see it's a container. This is a, a, a really uh, sad story that I witnessed also in one of the rural, during my work. Um, I was in one of the villages um, uh, distributing drugs and then later on I came back to another village where we were camping with my team. And as we came into the village, there were people sitting under the tree because usually in some of these communities, the only place you could have community meetings was under the tree. They don't have buildings like this. They, are, they have huge trees with good shed, and that's where the local court was held or community meeting. So anyway, there was a, a, a local case being handled by the local police boss, who is the, the government in such places. And some people, 11 people are accused of attacking a vehicle and killing somebody. So they were sentenced to, uh, to prison. And they didn't take them to a normal house, like they usually have uh, small huts made from grass and, and uh, mud. They didn't take them there. They took them to the container because they were afraid that they would escape or something like that. They took them to an airless container. And I, I got shocked, but I didn't say anything because it was then dangerous to be able to speak out what I felt. I'm sorry to say I did not say anything. I just kept quiet. And this picture, I took it uh, secretly without them knowing. And the following day, after they were put in the container, 11 people, three, the following day were dead from suffocation. It was really hot. Like during the day, it was 40 degrees. And one of the bodies is being taken, and another one was lying down somewhere. Um, so it is just an example to show, like in some of the rural places, it was really difficult to get a fair judgment if you have done a criminal or, I mean, if you have done a yeah, criminal offense or something. Um, yeah, so that was a, a difficult uh, thing to see. Um, yeah, when I left in uh, 2009, there was peace since four years. They, yeah, since 2005, uh, but I left in 2009. Uh, I traveled 300 kilometers to get to the capital, Juba, because somehow, because of the challenges also of South Sudan, I had missed my plan. It came, and I was given the wrong time to go to the airstrip. So by the time I was going to the airstrip, the plane had gone. And so I had to go by road to, to the capital, uh, Juba. The security along the road was not good, and as a result... Uh, of the war, there were a lot of guns among the people and bandits along the road. So I had to hire po uh, escort, police escort, people armed with guns to escort me up to Juba. And uh, they traveled with me all the way, but good enough, nothing happened on the road. And then uh, I was happy to be in Juba, of course. And then I took my last plane out after nine years of working there. So, yeah. Um, but for the first time, nowadays things are improving. When I left in 2009, also you could see the difference in Juba. They were repairing roads, schools were being built, uh, clinics were being built, and I think now the situation is improving a little bit, although in the rural areas it's still a little bit different. For the first time, people had freedom of speech and freedom to vote this year. They voted for independence, they voted for freedom, and I think they will have, uh, they, have, they have the fifth freedom which we are talking about, the freedom of time. And uh, it's a long road, they have to go, but I think in the end they will get there. There are still challenges, but uh, they will get there. So, thank you. That was my experience in, uh, in South Sudan, especially. <laughs>